Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa, Kote Po Koko Mat Mate Mato Raka O. My name's Stuart Brock, and I am the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this very, very special occasion to celebrate the promotion of Sally Shaw to Professor. These lectures are a highlight of my week, as I'm sure they are of yours too. They're a wonderful opportunity for us to come together and listen to our new professors talk about their personal journeys, their research platform, and their, the impact that research has had on others. I'd like to welcome colleagues, students and friends from across the university, including those joining us via live stream. I would like to give a special welcome to Sally's wife, Janice Murray, as well as other members of Sally's wider whanau. Because I know Sally is an avid golfer, I would also like to acknowledge Sally's golfing friends attending this evening. Welcome to you all. It's not, an, it's not easy to become a professor at the University of Otago. In order to be promoted to that level, candidates need to show that they are outstanding in each of three categories, research, teaching and service. Sally has clearly met these criteria and it's, and it's an honour and a privilege to congratulate her tonight for that outstanding achievement. Sally is an internationally renowned researcher in the field of sports management. Most of her publications are in the area of sexuality and gender relations in sport organisations, diversity, equality and inclusion in sport management and governance, sport volunteer management and qualitative research methods in sport. Tonight, Sally will reflect on her academic career to tell us a little bit about her own personal journey. She will tell us about the positive impact of, that, of her theoretically informed research on sports managers. She will also tell us a little bit about her teaching and her students. But for, before Sally does that, I'll hand over to Professor Richard Barker, Pro Vice Chancellor for the Division of Sciences, to introduce Professor Shaw. Tenekoto, tenekoto, tenekoto kato. Professor Brock, tēnā koe. Professor Shaw, tēnā koe. Associate Professor Hargraves, tēnā koe. Emeritus Professor Murray, tēnā koe. And can I say congratulations on your recent nuptials. Friends and colleagues, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Sally Shaw from the School of Physical Education, Sport and Exercise Sciences, to give her inaugural professorial lecture at the University of Otago. As indicated by Professor Brock, Sally was promoted to professor in February of this year, and tonight we get to celebrate this significant achievement. Professor Shaw grew up in Edinburgh, and she claims that she doesn't have much of a Scottish accent. Um, I'm not so sure about this. There's definitely an accent. I wouldn't have said uh, Glaswegian, no, no, um, yeah, but yeah, definitely an accent. She attended St. Leonard's School in the beautiful town of St. Andrews as a boarder where she was head girl. In her briefing, she said you could insert a joke here, and I couldn't think of one, but, <laughs> but I did think that Sally as head girl didn't surprise me. <laughs> and of course, St. Andrews is the home of golf, and she says she must be a slow learner. She didn't start playing golf until her late 30s. Now, I just compared notes with Sally, because I've also taken up golf, and I see the golfers here. Um, and her handicap's 22 strokes better than mine, so I'm looking for a few tips. Um, but I know one of the tips is no profanity, and it's golf. It's really hard, right? <laughs> Sally obtained a Bachelor of Arts with Honours in Sociology from the University of York before undertaking her Master's in Sports Management from Sheffield, and then a PhD at De Montfort University. The interest in sports management was sparked when she worked for Sport England in the mid-1990s and noticed that when public money was being poured into the sports sector, many of the old implicit gendered cultural norms that have been part and parcel of amateur sport 
were unquestioningly incorporated into the newly professional era. For many women in sports, governance who had been running efficient, low-budget women's sports organisations, this was a very difficult time. Thank you for those words, Sally. uh, On completion of her PhD, Professor Shaw took up her first academic appointment as an assistant professor in the Department of Sport Management at Brock University, Ontario, Canada. This lasted just under a year before she decided to cross the Pacific to take up a post at the University of Waikato. In 2005, we were successful in attracting Professor Shaw Southwood and she took up the post of lecturer in our sport of physical education, sport and exercise science and commenced her um, rising through the academic rankings to achieve the professor of, uh, excuse me, achieve the position of professor, which we celebrate tonight. As we have heard from Professor Brock, Promotion to full professor at the University of Otago was far from easy. You must excel in all academic domains of teaching, research and service. And Sally has truly excelled. She's an internationally acclaimed critical organisational management researcher in the field of sports management and has a strong track record of publications in sexuality and gender relations in sport organisations, diversity, equity and inclusion in sport management and governance, sport organisational governance, sport volunteer management, and innovative qualitative research methods in sport. This research has had real impact. Professor Shaw was contracted to support New Zealand rugby and New Zealand cricket to improve their inclusion practices, and led and implemented the first New Zealand study into anti-homophobia policies with six of our national sport organisations. Professor Shaw is also an outstanding teacher, and this teaching is noted for its innovation and leadership. The school recently went through a major curriculum overhaul, and as part of this, Professor Shaw led the design of the postgraduate program in the school, as well as developing new curriculum content in the area of sport development and management. This leadership and teaching extends beyond the school, and as Associate Dean Postgraduate, for the Division of Sciences, she led the division's contribution to the, Q- the Quality Ad- Advancement Unit review of postgraduate programs in sciences over the period 2016-2020. And, and in- this included writing a he- hefty divisional self-review document and then following this up with a high-quality evaluation of the divisional postgraduate programs following the review recommendations. As this example shows, Professor Shaw's service to the academic and professional communities has been exemplary, and her service to the university stands out for me personally, as this has how I've come to know Sally and her considerable talents, and can I add forbearance. As the inaugural Associate Dean Postgraduate for the Division of Sciences, Sally developed the template for what dedicated service in this role looks like. She represented the Sciences Division on the Board of Graduate Studies, on the Graduate Research and Scholarships Committee, on Senate, she chaired three postgraduate admissions committees, moderated student grievances, investigated academic integrity cases, appeals also that followed some of those conducted by other people, and was a member of the Sciences Standing Committee, as well as holding periods as acting PVC. This was all undertaken at a time when the division had to go through some quite significant and difficult restructuring. Sally's support through this was immense, and for this I want to say thank you. I think that's enough from me. It's now time to hear from Professor Shaw herself, one of our fabulous women in science here at the University of Otago. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sally Shaw. doing that with shaky hands. <laughs> Tēnā koutou katoa, he mihi mahana kia koutou. No mai haere mai ki te hui nei. No mai, oh, sorry, he mihi mahana kia koutou. No mai haere mai ki te hui nei. No Edinburgh Kotorana, aho. Ko Sally Shaw, aho. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you for those really um, moving words actually. Richard, I'll almost forgive you for forgetting your tie. But um, <laughs> I was lining up my joke of uh, who chose your tie and can't do it, gutted. Thanks everyone for coming, both golfers and non-golfers alike. Um, 
It's, uh, it's a funny old thing I've discovered doing these. So here we are and I'll crack on with it and try and get through in plenty of uh, time so that we can all go somewhere else. Thanks for the tie, Sebastian, much appreciated. <laughs> Uh, sport. Sport is a funny old thing. It's a place of entertainment, it's a place of joy, it's a place of tragedy, it's a place of heartache. What I didn't tell Richard, of course, was my heartbreaking loss in the club champs on Sunday. Um, and uh, for many of us, it also offers great community, uh, great friendship and uh, great passion. For many women and for many LGBTQ plus people, and I apologize for this slide because it's awful, but um, it's just a quick, what do they all mean? It can also be a place of marginalization. It can be a place of exclusion. It can be a place of bullying, and it can be a place of gendered and sexualized violence as well, as well as all those good things. And those are some of the things that I want to uh, cover a little bit tonight. Um, yes, talking about um, how I've got here and, and all the rest of it, um, but also hopefully leaving you um, on a bit of an up, as well as some of the question marks along the way. Um, it's fair to say that I have always been fairly sporty, and although it's true I did not start golf till my mid-30s, there is some activity going on with a golf club and a, and a ball there. I couldn't call it golf myself, but... Um, yeah, and I was quite cute. Um, <laughs> to be fair, some of you know me better as this version with chin and grit and determination and all those things that I seem to bring to most things. Um, and what you don't know also about that golf photo is I was, there was an internal out of bounds in that golf course and I was praying it didn't go in there. So um, for those of you in the know. Um, uh, my life began in Edinburgh, Bonnie, Scotland, um, and uh, I was brought up in a village um, called Balerno, just about eight miles old school outside of Edinburgh, on the good side for the airport. Um, and like many small Scottish villages, it did a good line in grey architecture, um, and but it was is a very pretty pretty village. Perhaps more interestingly, it's the source of the Water of Leith. Who knew? The other one. Uh, and you can follow the Water of Leith all the way down to the docks um, in Edinburgh um, there. The landscape photos, which I must thank my sister for, uh, are um, of the beginning of the Pentland uh, Regional Park. Pentland Hills are just near where we lived and I was lucky enough as a kid to do a fair bit of messing about there. And I think if you squint a bit, maybe they're a little bit like the Mongatua. I don't know, just something in there somewhere. That might be a bit of a stretch. Anyway, uh, yeah, thanks to my big sister who took those at about probably midday on a winter's day, which is um, about all the sun you're gonna get. Um, the rest of the family. So uh, my family is made up of my mum up there in the red cardi. Uh, my dad who died when I was about seven um, and uh, but I've never just had one parent. I've always had the love and care also of my Aunt Jane, who's there in her um, auntly blouse up there in the top. Um, the, the, the big picture is, is everybody. It's my brother John, my uh, nephews, William and uh, Freddie, Georgia and Jessie, my nieces, my sister-in-law Anna, who as usual is looking the most sensible of all of us, uh, my brother-in-law James and mum again and Sappy the dog. Um, this was taken before the pandemic when time was normal and so apologies to my nieces and nephews for those old photos. You look much cooler now, I know. Um, and then there's another picture of the four of us there. I was a pretty average, yeah, here we go, yeah, I was a pretty average student at school, it has to be said, um, and I took off to the University of York, as Richard said, uh, and um, studied sociology. Uh, Sociology to me was, was interesting, but I don't think I really got it when I was that age. It, it, there was, um, it was at the time, sort of late 80s, early 90s, where a lot of the neoliberal Thatcherite reforms were coming into play in England. And there were a lot of people, my, my peers at the university, whose families were living through those reforms and what that meant for them in person. I come from a very privileged upper middle class Edinburgh background and I just didn't really understand some of the, the challenges that people were, were um, coming up against then. But there were a few things that kind of stuck. Um, 
I got a, uh, what used to be called a sportsman's, but we'll call it sports persons given the topic, degree of a 2-2, and took my um, careers advisor's uh, um, advice very seriously when she walked into the second last lecture of our, of our degree and said, if you're going to do a degree in sociology, you won't be getting a job. And so off I went traveling for a bit. And uh, that was the first time that I came to Aotearoa, New Zealand in 1993 and had a bit of a look around. And I'm, I'm really grateful that I, um, I saw New Zealand then. I came back to the UK and went to the University of Sheffield to start my master's in sport management. Um, that was really kind of luck as well as good judgment. Um, again, it was um, at a time where uh, there was a lot of money going into English sport. Um, as Richard has said, the, the, the professionalization of sport organizations that had until that time been amateur, very volunteer, and, and sport organizations were really kind of trying to work out what to do with this money and this professionalism and, and, and this um, demand really for accountability. And sport management as an academic discipline was really just starting off in the UK then as well. It'd been well entrenched in, in the United States and Canada where there's a much stronger professional um, ethos, but it was really just, just starting. And, and I, I really loved that. Um, I really loved doing my master's. It was, a, it was a really great time. And I thought that I would end up working in sport development because that's what I thought I would do. I went off to um, my first job, uh, which was in Bedford, there just north of um, London, very small town, market town. And I did work for a year for what was initially called the Sports Council, and in a dramatic demonstration of Anglo-centric behaviour, suddenly the Sports Council realised there are actually three other countries in the United Kingdom, so they had to rapidly change their name to the English Sports Council. Um, just saying. Um, that was a, that was that was a kind of a tricky time because um, it, it really was a, an example of people who had been in the amateur world very quickly becoming professional and very quickly having to make decisions about their, what they were going to do with funding, and really not thinking about the um, consequences of some of the actions that that they were taking. So assumptions about women's ability, girls' ability in sport were really just unquestioningly turned into policies and programs that did very little to try and um, try and um, rebalance some of the um, the inconsistencies and the and the um, the unfairness that was was embedded in that um, in that institution. So it was not uncommon, for example, for for the men who were in the, this more senior positions to say things like, well, you know, wh why should we fund women's sport? Why should we fund girls' sport? What does it matter that they're, you know, off on the terrible playing fields and the guys have got the good fields? It just, just didn't really matter. And of course, I found that extremely frustrating having come from a very sort of sporty background. Um, my job was a three-way partnership between three institutions, uh, Sport England, uh, sorry, English Sports Council, which later became Sport England, De Montfort University and the National Coaching Foundation that was um, centered up in uh, Leeds uh, in the north of England. And f a job came up at De Montfort University uh, as a lecturer and I thought, oh, I could do that. So I went along to, uh, got an interview and I was woefully underprepared uh, and um, uh, somehow, however, managed to make enough of an impression on this man who is Professor Trevor Slack, uh, now deceased, sadly. Um, and he, again, our neoliberal uh, funding at work, it was at a time where um, De Montfort University, that part of the campus had been a teacher training college, a PE teacher training college, a very well known one. Um, and they were trying to build it up into a research institution. And he'd been brought in from the University of Alberta in Canada to, um, to do that. So he had a whole bunch of PhD scholarships at his um, fingertips, which was fantastic. And he offered me one. So I obviously didn't do that badly, but that was pretty bad. Um, my other supervisor uh, was Professor Dawn Penny, who, who some of you know. Dawn is a fearsome 
<laughs> fearsome um, academic. She really was one of those academics that, or well, is, sorry, Dawn, uh, really is one of those academics that um, you knew, you, I knew my PhD was nearly ready when it had no red pen all over it. And each page would come back just covered in red pen, covered in red pen. Dawn knows this, and I hope she understands that I'm saying this with great love, that uh, it, was, it was a challenge. I've no doubt I was a challenge. Anyway, she's at Edith Cowan now. So eventually I got my degree, looking quite surprised about it all. And um, it was in the construction of gender relations in sport organizations, which as all PhD students will learn, you never would call your PhD that ever again, if you could do it again. So onto a bit of the kind of academic stuff. Um, what really grabbed me when I was doing my PhD and what Dawn was responsible for introducing me to was, was social theory and, and social theories and the relationship between social theory and qualitative methodologies. What we think about what we're doing and how those thoughts inform our methodologies, which then inform the method, i.e. how we do our research. So I, we examine social phenomena, in my case, sport organizations. It can be anything you like. It can be academic institutions, it can be education, it can be health, anything you like. And in social theory, what we do is we, we take frameworks of ideas that have been debated and discussed and written about and put into practice and not put into practice over many, many years and decades and sometimes even centuries. And we try to see if those theories will help us to explain the social phenomena that we're wanting to understand. In my research, I've looked at organizational power, so the power relations that go on in organizations. What does it say about me standing up here in my back cape? What does it say about you know, the, the, even the architecture around somewhere like a, a university? And also gender relations. So why is it that so often, particularly in sport, men and men's interests are privileged over women and women's interest. And sexuality, why is it that in some sports it's still okay to say, well, I don't want a woman teaching, I don't want a woman coach because um, she might be a lesbian and she might turn my daughter into a lesbian. Why is that still something that we can still say is okay? And Theory and methodology, these theories, these ideas, the methodologies, the way we think about doing our research and the research that we conduct, in my case, most often interviews, but, but sometimes um, video blogs, uh, sometimes um, participant um, observation, are really tightly woven. So the way we think about what we do and the way we do it are really closely tied together. These approaches are rigorous and they are valid and they are trustworthy. They are participant centered. They have processes around them that physical and biomechanical and, and positivist scientists may not immediately think of as being rigorous and valid and trustworthy, but trust me, they are. <laughs> but we don't seek rigor. We don't seek validity and we don't seek trustworthiness as, trustworthiness as goals of our research. It is the processes that we go through in weaving theory and methodology and method together that give us rigorous, valid, and trustworthy research. And what I love about theory, and it's probably a good thing for me, is it provides what I call close distance. So I'm passionate about what I do. But theory, going back to the books and reading some of the things that have gone before, gives me the opportunity to take a step back and go back to the theory and go, hang on a minute, you're getting too close, you're getting too passionate about this. Let's just back off a bit and see if we can um, just get a bit of distance from what it is that we're doing. So that's the approach that I've taken throughout my career. One of the main things that I looked at, particularly when I was starting out, was um, gender discourse. And one of the best explanations of discourses that I've ever come across, you hear this word a lot in, in kind of media and, and sort of social discourse and narratives at the moment, is the space between what can be said when you observe something and then what we actually say. So you might be watching a women's rugby match, for the sake of argument. You might be watching the match too, and there might not be very many people in the crowd. And someone might say, oh, well, no one watches women's sport. Ugh, no one cares about women's sport. That would be a discourse. 
they have seen that and that's what they have chosen to say. Somebody else might say, well, yeah, but the reason that people aren't watching it is because actually it's been programmed exactly the same time as the Highlanders game. And so maybe we could have done that differently and more people might have watched the matter too. And somebody might say, well, women's sport don't make money, so it doesn't make money, so what's the point? And somebody else might say, <laughs> yes, women's sport might not make money, but actually, nor does a lot of men's sport. And the money that is made in men's sport is only made because it has been invested in for generations and generations. So you can see that you take something like an empty stadium at a women's rugby game, and there are multiple ways that we can understand it, right? Uh, I wasn't sure if you could actually see this, but um, that's, the, that's the writing, but I take it you have. And I think many of us in the room may perhaps have been in a situation where this could possibly have been the case. Now, the uh, white European dude who um, kind of came up with the idea of discourse or popularized it, I suppose, is this man, Michel Foucault, and yes, I've deliberately made him look a bit spooky. Um, he, I don't know, I don't know if he invented the idea, but he certainly kind of took it on. And his, his idea was to look at things particularly like psychology, um, health, and uh, the problem with many of the social theorists is that they don't think about gender. So one of the things that I've tried to do is bring gender into some of the, um, the social theories that I work with. Let's get rid of him. So a few discourses that we see in sport management, uh, and that this is some of the stuff that I've worked through with various organizations, is what has been called the ad women and stir. So we need to get some women in to our boards. So we just bring them in, Let's just bring women in to our boards and, and then we'll be good. Got women in now, we're done, we've got equity. Guess what, if you've got a board of 14 or 15 guys and one woman, it's not going to last very long and it's not going to make much change. So adding women and stirring, but not doing anything about our structures, our policies, our processes, that's not going to change anything. The other organizational discourse that we sometimes hear is fixing the women. This is uh, the um, women in leadership, not all women in leadership courses, but some where, and I've been to some of them, where you're told that you need to dress in a certain way, you need to present yourself in a certain way. I know a chair of a provincial rugby board who is a woman who was told that she would never be taken seriously because her voice was too soft and that the people on the board couldn't hear her. I would suggest that some of the people on the board might need their hearing checked <laughs> and perhaps they could invest in some microphones with their investment from various New Zealand rugby sources. The, the one that kind of sticks a bit is valuing women. So this is sort of not recent, it's not recent, but it's been around for a while. But okay, we're gonna get bring women in because women will make our organization effective and profitable and we'll get new members. And if we have women, all these other women are gonna turn up. Okay, yep, maybe, maybe we will get new markets. Maybe we will get new members. But the problem with this approach is that if those things don't happen and don't happen quickly, guess who gets the blame? And guess who leaves, right? So I'm interested in this, the easy one, the fourth frame, making small, deep cultural changes to our organizations, to work with organizations, to see can they incrementally change so that those places can be more welcoming, more balanced. Everybody's gonna be gendered. Everyone's got assumptions about what it is to be a man and a woman. That's, that's never gonna stop. And all the bits in between, that's never gonna stop. But can we balance some of that up a little bit just to recognize some of those things in our organizations and make some changes to make them uh, more equitable? The fourth frame in sport management can look a little bit like this. We have outcome-based funding. So on the face of it, outcome-based funding sounds great. If you win lots of medals, sport organizations, you're going to get uh, lots of money. The other way you can think about this is winning at all costs. And often those costs are at the mental and physical health of athletes and coaches. So I would say, let's think more broadly than that. Reviews into cycling, into rowing, into athletics, into gymnastics, into hockey. 
suggests that outcomes-based funding isn't such a great idea and it can have really detrimental effects on the people who we are trying to make get these medals. So let's think a little differently about our funding. Let's also think a little bit differently about the way we do things around here. Okay, this is, this is always good. Um, and just recently, just last week, some of the girls at the Mardi Regatta, which is a big rowing competition, uh, questioned why should the girls have to always go first in their eight final, which is the big final, and then they get scraped off the podium smartish so the boys can then go and do theirs because the boys is the important one. And fair play to Mardi Regatta, they're like, yep, okay, we can probably do something about that and maybe rotate it. Well done, that's great. Others have said, because it's boys rowing that's more interesting and those are the people that are gonna go to the Olympics and, 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 and all those other excuses and don't be woke. So um, those are some of the sort of conversations that go on and I would say, well, let's just challenge some of the things that we do around here. And finally, our fourth frame that I would like to I like to encourage is our use of language in our sport organizations. And, and this one is recent. And at first sight, you might take a look at that and say, oh, that looks all right. That's, that's good, no more boys clubs, excellent. But if you dig just a little deeper, you'll find that that comes straight from the playbook from organizations like Save Women's Sport Australasia whose sole purpose is to exclude trans women from sport uh, at all levels. So this is some of the language that is being used potentially to inform, potentially, we haven't had, the, we haven't had a statement yet, to inform some of the regulation and future funding of sport organizations. And to me personally, that is abhorrent. So these are some of the uh, thoughts that thoughts work that has informed my research. Um, I'd like to just point out Wendy Frisbee, who's at the top there, Professor Wendy Frisbee from the University of British Columbia, and Professor Lorena Haber, who are two good friends and great researchers, and I've been lucky enough to work with them for a little while. Um, so that was a little bit of time, and then I think it's always somehow been on the cards that I would end up in Aotearoa, and this, unbelievably, <laughs> is a picture of me in about 1978 playing Tirako in a school in Edinburgh. Who, ha, I don't know, I can't remember how, I just assume that someone somewhere thought that, that was a good idea. There I am, practicing my associate dean look. <laughs> um, and what I love about this picture actually is if you look to this girl here, these two here, very cute, and that it's back in the day when kids didn't get their photos taken often, right? And they're like, oh, look, you're having your photo taken. Cool. You know, you, would you get that now? I don't know. Anyway, um, so sure enough, I did end up in New Zealand and um, moved here, as, as Richard's already said, in 2002 with my then partner, Justine Allen. And we also did um, a fair bit of research together. So. When we moved, when I moved to New Zealand, I didn't want to jump straight into the gender stuff because uh, I wasn't sure of the sort of lay of the land, different new country, different cultures, uh, learning uh, a little bit about Te um, and And I know this may be hard for some of you to believe, but I didn't actually want to jump on too many sensitivities in, in one go. Um, so we were lucky enough to be involved in a project that was going on around sport governance. Uh, and particularly working between Trust Waikato and Sport Waikato, who had a partnership uh, which really was quite cutting edge at the time and, and really focused on, rather than outputs, they really focused on trust, on humanity, and, and trying to work well together as, as partners when they um, were putting things into, putting um, programs and policies and so on into play. So that was, a, that was, a, that was a, an interesting time and it was good to have that research because it did give me a bit of time to learn a little bit about Aotearoa uh, and, um, and uh, yeah, just get a sense really of, of what, what was going on. Um, however, one moment, see if the hands are still shaky. There really should be a robot that can do that. 
Um, however, I couldn't help myself, of course. And so um, at the time, so this is what, 2006, uh, New Zealand was starting to, also starting to professionalize more. So the Hillary Commission had become Spark in about 2002, I think. And that signaled a change in how sport was funded. We went from donations and grants to much more competitive funding. Um, and as with uh, what we'd seen in the UK uh, about a decade earlier, uh, there was more attention sort of starting to be paid to, uh, to gender relations. Um, largely because as some of these kind of traditional um, gender relations were being um, expressed in the professional organizations, more and more women were saying, look, you just, you have to pay attention to us actually, you know, we're, we're not just gonna take this. So I did a little study um, which asked the question, should Spark, should what Sport New Zealand was eventually became, um, should they be guiding gender relations in regional sports trusts? Should they be putting things in place? Should we have equity programs? Should we have equity policies? Uh, the short answer to that was no. The regional sports trust uh, managers and CEOs said, no, nope, I don't think we should. They also thought we would tell Spark to mind their own business if they started to do things like that. And that honestly was a little bit of a surprise. I don't know why, but it was. I do know why, because I think in the UK, things had moved along a little bit and I was a little startled that sport spark was not taking more of a role in getting women, women involved in sport. Until I went to a conference and presented this stuff and a person from Spark stood up, stood up in the questions, which is unusual, and said, well, we don't recognize gender as a problem. And many of you have heard this story before, but I still wish, and I will take this to my grave, wishing that I had been fast enough to say, well, I don't recognize you, but you're still standing here being all right, pain, but, or something to that effect. Anyway, I missed the opportunity. That might be the last time I tell that story, so hang on to it. Um, so, yeah, so it was, a bit of a tricky time. I, I sort of, I had very kind of hopeful ideas that I might be able to work with sport organizations in New Zealand because it's, you know, it is a, sm a smaller country. Everyone knows each other in the sport world and that perhaps there might be some flexibility and perhaps there might be some appetite for change, but this really suggested perhaps not at the time. The other thing that came out a wee bit later on was this policy and this was why women on company go boards are good for business. Now, if you're still with me, you may recall <laughs> that that is a good example of valuing the women, valuing the feminine. And I remember actually driving out of Countdown <laughs> when this was announced on the radio and hitting my steering wheel. I was so cross that, that, that this was it, 10 years nearly, after there was research saying, not just my research, plenty of research across various industries saying this doesn't work, that this was gonna be it. This is how we are going to make women useful to our businesses. And there were a number of things kind of going on at the time, uh, not least the breakup of my long-term relationship, but also this that really made me question what I was doing and why I was doing it here in New Zealand. And I certainly toyed with the idea of packing in being an academic. I certainly toyed with the idea of um, going back to the UK, going to the US, doing something else. And I also decided, because I didn't have enough on my plate, that I would start to address uh, my lifetime companion, which is a generalized anxiety disorder. So I thought I'll just put all that together in a nice package. And the reason for bringing this up, not to kill the mood, is that anxiety is an interesting, you can do this if you like, it's pretty good. Um, anxiety is a great motivator, isn't it, Ken? Only if you manage it well, and I wasn't managing it well. And what I was telling myself was if I didn't keep doing all this stuff, something terrible was going to happen. 
the trick is once you start managing it and realizing that there's something terrible maybe isn't going to happen, you then have to take a really good look at yourself and say, okay, so why actually am I doing this? If I'm not doing this because of the terrible thing, why am I doing this? And so I went through quite a lot of breathe in and breathe out, and I still do go through like quite a lot of those, trying to figure it all out. So that's just a, something to think about and maybe to take away is once you, you know, knowing why you're doing what you're doing, I guess is a, is a kind of important message. I will be very grateful to these people be, forever because while I was really struggling with where I sat with gender stuff in, in New Zealand, what I was doing with my own mental health uh, and life in general, a number of um, a number of people knocked on my door, uh, not literally, and um, said, "Would I like to be involved in a number of these in these research projects?" And um, the good thing about them was that I wasn't having to lead them, so so I was able to kind of go along and help out where I could. Sarah Liebman, who's top, what's that, top left for you guys in the orange, uh, she got me involved in a bunch of really interesting research about leadership with women, career readiness, uh, and doing some investigations into gambling revenue and sport organizations. Lorena, who is a long, lifelong friend, uh, and my academic sister, as I call her, um, got me involved in some, some work around qualitative research methods, and that's something that I've kept going with. Uh, Robin and Pip Lynch, um, we did some pretty cool work, I think, on governance and outdoor uh, organizations. And then bottom right for you is uh, Lisa Keel and Vicky Shule at the University of Minnesota who were doing some work on the merger of um, the men's and women's athletic departments at a tier one university, which was, I can tell you, quite the story. And yes, I do do research with men too. Uh, Associate Professor Jeff Dixon, who's now at La Trobe, and Jeff and I uh, did a project on, um, on that merger of women's and men's golf in, uh, in uh, New Zealand. So that kind of just kept me ticking over and it was all good and, and life carried on as it does. Then, 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 this, this report came out. And this Out in the Fields report is, was uh, developed by Eric Dennison and his colleagues at uh, Monash in, uh, in Australia. First international study on homophobia in sport. Uh, and what they did was they did, uh, inter uh, no, not interviews, they did a survey um, across multiple countries uh, looking at both gay and straight people's um, uh, experiences of homophobia in sport and what it looked like. And it's, it's a very revealing and interesting um, report and, and certainly hugely insightful. And that just kind of got me kind of thinking a wee bit. At the same sort of time, a year later, New Zealand Rugby, as you might remember, was going through a bit of a disaster. Um, they had a uh, series of sex scandals and they eventually decided to um, have a review of their culture regarding gender and sex, sexuality um, in rugby. So that came out at that point too. And I sort of think, okay, there might be, you know, a bit of life in the old dog yet. And then a year later, uh, the Sport and Active Recreation uh, Women and Girls um, uh, strategy came out from um, Sport New Zealand. So things were just starting to turn the corner a wee bit in, in, in my world. And what really grabbed me was these two comments in these reports that New Zealand rugby was willing to at least consider uh, what gender, sexuality, and ethnicity meant um, in terms of people's experience of rugby. And that, that's, that was new. That was pretty groundbreaking for New Zealand rugby to be able to do that and fair play to them. And in uh, the women's sport uh, strategy, a drive, albeit a short sentence, but still a drive to understand the challenges and opportunities women and girls can face due to sexual orientation. So these three things kind of, they, they gave me a bit of a kick in the butt, to be perfectly honest. And so I thought, right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to stick my neck out and I'm going to get involved in this. The Out in the Fields report did not have a representative in New Zealand. So I offered to become their New Zealand rep. That project was kind of finished. So they were like, yeah, we're kind of done. So no thanks. 
Um, but they did put me in touch with various people uh, in Aotearoa who were involved with it. Um, the question that this really got me looking at was which women are we talking about when we talk about women in sport? And we don't often look at the experiences of sexually diverse uh, women in sport. So this you know, really was something that I am passionate about and able to get into. So I went back to New Zealand rugby and Ian Long, who was the head of public affairs at the time there, uh, was um, starting a group called Sport for Everyone. And uh, this had uh, those five, five, not six, sorry, Richard, five um, sports involved in it. And the premise of this group at the start was to look at homophobia in sport, across these five sports. And they got together, they met, I met with them, I, I mapped out perhaps how they might go about, you know, finding out, you know, what maybe some of the makeup of their organizations was, uh, how could they perhaps be more inclusive, did they feel the need to be inclusive, who was it that they wanted to, to work with. So we had a few meetings about, about that. And then slowly, and some of you may have already observed, there, are, there were quite a few differences in the makeup of this group, and that made this really tricky. So you can see on the um, right-hand column there that we've got one, two, three, four different uh, titles of people involved in this project. You've got head of public affairs, community netball, a technical manager, so that's things like rules and regulations of the game, another community development, and then human resources. So we had these really conflicting priorities working towards this not terribly well-defined goal, tricky goal. As time went on, um, the other than New Zealand Rugby, the other organizations also decided that actually they had other priorities and who it was that they wanted to work with in terms of inclusion whether that was gender, whether that was disability, whether it was ethnicity. Uh, and, and so the, 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 um, the, the group kind of disbanded. And this is always the way, you know, you're very, in these situations, you're very reliant on the people who, the individuals who are holding the, um, holding the torch and, and showing the way. And once they start to leave, these things kind of um, go by the wayside. So it wasn't just the, the various people who are responsible, it was also, you know, who are we talking to? Who is our community? Who are the people that we want to address? Who are the people that we want to include? Uh, and talking about sexuality is really difficult. Right? It's not easy, it's, it's hard. Uh, and so trying to encourage people within organizations to start to try and think about how, how do we talk about sexuality in our organization? What are some of the ways that we understand sport as sexualized? Is our sport somewhere that a homophobic slur is, is really common? If it is, do we, what, do we care? Do we want to care? Do we want to do something about it? How do we do that? So really kind of moving these uh, organizations into a space that is, is challenging. And um, it's fair to say it was quite chaotic. Uh, and so I wrote that, <laughs> the chaos of inclusion. Um, and, and it really started to, I really started to understand how difficult some of this work was for sport organizations. So then uh, I also went back to my theories and I realized that the theories that I'd been using didn't quite cut it. So I went into uh, another load of books and I've started in the last few years reading about queer theory. All that queer theory means is that it is a theory, it's a, it's, a, it's a group of theories that talks about disrupting and challenging some of our norms and uh, taken for granted assumptions, in my case, about how organizations work. It doesn't have to be about being queer. It is a, uh, it's a, it's um, a verb to, um, destabilized to, to unsettle some of our assumptions. And at its core are um, our challenges to some of the things that we take for granted. So 
if we start to think about gender on a continuum or as flexible and fluid, then perhaps men and women and our understandings of sport are not as different as we might have first thought. So perhaps there's a little bit of overlap and a little bit of common ground that we can work on. And that helps us maybe to blur some of the boundaries between them and us in our organizations. It also offers the opportunity to think about intersectionality, which is where we don't just talk about men and women and gay and straight. We start to bring in ideas about ethnicity, disability, age, other identities that, uh, that will be at play. So we start to build a picture of our organizations that is complex, but it also reflects the complexity of those organizations. We are complex people. If we all took a doodle poll, not a doodle poll, a VBOX poll about the things that are important to us, we'd all have different thoughts. We'd all have different experiences. And that's how organizations work. We're a mix of a whole bunch of different people. And when organizations start to recognize that and start to kind of try and see what our commonalities are, then there might be a little glimpse of ways that we can change to become more inclusive for the people who are not traditionally included. And in that way, inclusion just becomes an everyday thing. We start to challenge the language. We start to say, actually, I think we've got more in common than, than actually we first thought. Change isn't necessarily a goal. We don't try and achieve equity, but by working Every day in these little ways, maybe it's change and inclusion and equity might be something that might happen. And the thing I really like about it is it's creative. So in the messiness and the chaos and the craziness of our organizational lives, there is room, there are gaps, there is potential for change and creativity and difference. And I have to thank uh, Rosie Oberell and um, Bethany Geckel really for introducing me to this, um, this approach. So I went back to rugby again, because <laughs> they hadn't seen enough of me. And by this time, the wonderful Judy O'Brien work, is working at um, New Zealand Rugby. She is their cultural diversity and inclusion manager. And if you get a chance to read anything about Judy, please do, she is extraordinary. I hope, I hope and I think that New Zealand Rugby now know how lucky they are to have her in this role. And what I felt, what I had seen and observed anyway in my kind of observing of New Zealand Rugby was that although in the men's game, it's extremely homophobic in many ways, in the women's game, not so much. And it was, you know, it was the year when the, um, the Black Ferns 15s and 7s were doing really well. And you see this absolute celebration of same-sex relationships in those, in those teams. And it struck me that, you know, if that's happening, at, you know, if we can just, that's just how it is at those top levels. What is it that's going on in the community levels of, of um, sport, of women's uh, rugby, that perhaps is making it a bit different? What can we learn from women's rugby in terms of inclusion of different sexualities. What can New Zealand rugby learn for its you know, big picture? And, and what can we as sport managers learn? So I went uh, to New Zealand rugby and they were, they were generous enough, I must admit, to let me do this because they might not have. Um, and I did a survey and some interviews with uh, some uh, self-identifying women in the LGBTQ plus community. And just a couple of things that I'll focus on because this matters, obviously. But one of the things that came through so strongly was this community and this Fano that women's rugby had. And this is at the community grassroots level. We're not talking black ferns, absolutely not. We're talking about grassroots level. And the sense that we look after ourselves and we include people. And if someone's gonna come in and make some silly joke, we're gonna say, no, nah, we're not having that. Deal with it. And this is, this is how, how we operate. And this is um, how we look after our sisters 
and, and we, we embrace them and we love them and we celebrate them. So humor, humor can be a brilliant way in organizations to make change and to, and to um, inspire people. And this is what they're doing. They're like, okay, we're not gonna get offended by this. We're just gonna give this guy shit and you know, tell him this is not what's gonna happen. This is, this is how we're gonna roll in this organization. Slightly more seriously, um, this quote is in relation to the strange thing in women's sport where some coaches and some players, mainly coaches, get very uptight about same-sex couples in the same team. And they feel that because, because you're in a relationship, you're gonna wreck the team culture, wreck the team, team spirit. And there are several instances um, where coaches have banned lesbian couples from being in the same uh, team at the same time, which, hmm. anyway, um, they, the, the point that this respondent is making is that, okay, put the spotlight, sure, put the spotlight on same-sex couples, all right? But if we're going to do that, we have to do the same for heterosexual couples and families that are really heavily involved in sport. It, nobody bats an eyelid if a husband coaches a wife's team. And yet the potential for conflict of interest there is just as great as two women on the same team. You know, parents coach their kids. You know, and, and yep, great, good on you, mum, dad, for coming along and coaching, but does anyone ever really question that? No, oh, they really don't. So if you're going to question the same sex relationship in the sport, question the other relationships too. Let's make this discourse equitable. Let's make this an equitable playing field. Unfortunately, I didn't speak to Ruby too, but she's cool, so I left her up there. <laughs> Um, and then, as some of you may know, <laughs> the FIFA Women's World Cup rolled into town last year. And this project, which I'm still doing, is with uh, Monica Nelson, who's on top there, and Professor uh, Simone Fullagar. Hi, Monica. Hi, Simone. I think you're watching live. Hope the popcorn's good, Simone. Um, and we wanted to uh, look at the experiences of LGBTQ plus uh, fans and participants in, in the Women's World Cup. Mainly because, again, how the Women's World Cup was portrayed as something that was gonna be about women, for women, um, embracing and developing women, and my lovely grad students here know all much more about this than I do, but the question is never asked, well, which women? What about the LGBTQ plus women? Uh, those women are used to advertise it. Megan Rapinoe, uh, Megan Rapinoe Sam Kerr, right there front and center. But what's the experience like for those who are at the event themselves? So here is a quote from a participant who's saying, talking about this idea of intersectionality, make sure that we are you know, in the conversation for sport organizations. Make sure that we exist. Make sure that we're given a place to feel safe. Look at yourselves, sport organizations, and see what it is you can do to do a better job of representing us and others like us. Again, self, safe spaces. Not, we don't want to be tolerated. We don't want to be accepted. We want to be embraced and celebrated, just like everybody else is. Just like, you know, we want to get into it. We want to enjoy it. We want to be part of it. We want to get into the arguments, the debates, the discussions. We don't want to be oh, bring in the gays. We don't want that. And then this, you know, we exist. We are people who deserve to be taken seriously in sport organizations. To quote Pink, <laughs> kindness is a revolutionary act. And many other people have said that recently. But I think at the moment, you know, this sort of potential to bow, bow down to hatred or fear, particularly in the trans women space at the moment, is so close and tight. And just take the time to think in our sport organizations about what can we do differently to just be better, do better as sport organizations. It won't come as a huge surprise to you that not everybody loves my research. And these are some of the adjectives that have been directed to me 
at various times during my research and, and also in my work as Associate Dean Postgraduate. Um, and frankly, I love it. It's either going to be a t-shirt or a gravestone, I don't know, whichever. Um, I'll take both. Um, the one that I do reflect on a little bit is, is being, call, being uh, called woke in a, uh, by a participant who said something along the lines of, you woke academics are all the same. You're trying to stir something up out of nothing. Just leave us alone. We want to just participate in our sport. And that really struck me. And I did a conference presentation about it last year because <clears throat> it's all very well, you know, jumping up and down on my academic bandwagon and saying we've got to do better with sport organizations. But I also have to remember, and those of us in this kind of area need to remember that some people do just want to get on with what it is they're doing and don't want to be, you know, looked at. So that has given me uh, pause for thought and, and fair enough. Um, having said that, of course, uh, I will always, I think, be um, that person. Uh, as long as I've got the privilege of being an academic, and being an academic is a privilege, there is no doubt about that. With that comes a huge responsibility. And in my view, and in my world, and this is not the same for everybody, that responsibility is to work with sport organizations in as positive a way as I possibly can, and it's not always positive work, to try and help those sport organizations to grapple with some things that are, are tricky and are difficult and do need a bit of mind bending. And if I'm allowed into those spaces, then, then I feel very grateful. And I, I really, I love working with sport organizations because the ones that want me in are generally trying to do something. None of this, of course, would be possible <laughs> without my lovely wife, Janice Murray, who I love to the moon and back. And some of you know her as Emeritus Professor Janice Murray. Some of you know as that woman that used to work in the division. <laughs> but thanks. Uh, we got married, in case you hadn't caught up with that. Um, and yeah. And thanks to everybody else. I've gone through a few thank yous as, on my talk. Um, and there's a whole bunch here more. If I left you off, and you think you should be there. I left the gray one with the question mark. So just write yourself in with a Sharpie and you'll be right, you'll be fine. Um, to my students, uh, the students, you guys that I'm working with at the moment, um, you're, you're just spectacular the way you guys just come through and you just kind of say all these things that I was struggling with when I was your age and you're just like, right there, yep, that's all done now. We're on to much more interesting and, and diverse things. So. Thank you for, for bringing that along. School of PE colleagues, um, we've had, as Richard alluded to, a tough few years, but thanks to good leadership, um, Chris and now Elaine, I think we're coming out the right side of it. So thank you for that. Division of, I'm not gonna read all of them, don't worry. Division of Sciences team, when I was Associate Dean Postgrad, you guys really were fun out and um, we had a good, good time, Richard. And I do like your ties and I am disappointed that you haven't got one. Uh, and who else is here? University colleagues, of course, um, and sorry, School of Physics P colleagues, in particular our admin and tech staff. Um, you guys do a lot of heavy lifting and it's behind the scenes and um, you are wonderful and you, you do a hell of a lot for us. So thanks everybody. Uh, that is all I have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>
of the highest standard. She has shown impact. I don't need to explain that to you. You have just seen um, what she has presented. Um, but she has made outstanding contribution and leadership to the gender diversity and inclusion practices and policies within the field of sport governance. And what I took from that is that she just doesn't make a difference in the field of academia, but actually in the world of sport governance. So it's happening in practice, which is a pretty good thing to be able to see that you're achieving and see difference because that's literally why we do this job right to make a difference in the world um she also in making those impacts in the sport governance world is making a difference to the athletes who are working who are participating in those fields um, and again that's a really special thing to see that you're making a difference in the athletes lives um, and she also achieves that through her excellent teaching, both through our undergraduates and her postgraduates, um, who will be the future of sport governance in New Zealand and internationally, because you do seem to attract a lot of international students, which is fantastic. Um, just a couple of things. So from a personal perspective, Professor Shaw and I have been next door office neighbours for a lot of years now. And one highlight for me was when she knocked on my door and said, Elaine, I think I want to do a survey. Can you help me with quantitative methods? So she has talked a lot about her qualitative background, but she has made a foray into survey based research. So that was a bit of a privilege for me to help her uh, create a survey so she could do her work with rugby and uh, the FIFA World Cup. Um, and she didn't also mention that she's made a foray into academic TikTok, um, which she also said, uh, which is also a highlight. So if you are not aware, then Google Sally Shaw TikTok and I'm sure it will come up. Um, I've also appreci appreciated your words of wisdom and support over the years. So it's, um, I'm very grateful to be able to celebrate with you today. Um, and my last joke, I expect that pro being prom promoted to professor was easier and less frustrating than reducing your golf handicap. <laughs> yes. And I have seen a lot of these faces that were on her golf pictures within the department as well. So it's not just a golf specific face that you have. Uh, so I'll just end by thanking all of you for coming to acknowledge Professor Shaw's achievements. And for those, if there are any online at Stupid O'Clock in Scotland um, and anywhere else in the world, thank you for tuning in and uh, showing your support. Um, I get to invite you guys over to the staff club um, after the formal pr proceedings concludes to continue the celebrations and to Sally we University has a gift for you so that you will remember this occasion. <laughs> <laughs>